and welcome to the Donahue Group. We're delighted that you can join us. We're a small but uh, interesting, hopefully, group of uh, citizens from the local area talking about issues of uh, interest to uh, people living in the city and, uh, and in the county. Joining me today, former State Senator Cal Potter, also former Assistant Superintendent for Libraries at the Department of Public Instruction. Uh, Professor Tom Paneski, math teacher at the University of Wisconsin Sheboygan Center, former alderman. You're the talking colleges. I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd get that wrong. Uh, and uh, Ken Risto, uh, a simple social studies teacher, as he says, but uh, also the director of the uh, social studies curriculum for the Sheboygan Area School District, and tell me how I got that title wrong. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. But he kind of runs the but social... But they change my title every year, so it doesn't make any difference. Well, there we go. It gets more complicated. That's a simple idea. Anyway. It gets longer, and the pay gets shorter. <laughs> but so, that's it. So that's it. Along with the school year. No, no, just kidding. So, and my name is Mary Lynn Donahue, and I'm a local attorney. I thought I'd start out. I had just a wonderful time reading Bill Moyer's speech to the National Conference for Media Reform, and this was given in May. Um, uh, in St. Louis, apparently. And just for all you public television friends out there, let me just read this real brief little paragraph from his speech. He says, public radio, public TV, cable access, public DBS channels, media art centers, youth media projects, nonprofit internet news services um, are all a part of a nearly invisible feature of today's media map, the public media sector. They do not exist to make a profit, not to push an ideology, not to serve customers, but to create a public, a group of people who can talk productively with those who don't share their views and defend the interests of the people who have to live with the consequences of corporate and governmental power. So I thought, here we are, uh, not serving customers, but to create a public. And so with that, I think we can get started. Uh, uh, this was kind of a, a high purpose, I thought, to the discussion today, besides just uh, sharing some information. Um, interesting times in the city. Um, the uh, front page article in the Sheboygan Press on Sunday talked about, uh, and actually the, the headline was interesting, the county grapples with diversity. Uh, kind of implies a fight, but um, saying that in 1980, Sheboygan's, uh, this is the city of Sheboygan's total population of 48,000, 98.3% was uh, white. Uh, by 2000, 20 years later, 88% uh, of the city households were white. Now, 88% is uh, still a fair amount, but that's a significant change with 3,200 plus Asian ancestry and 2,800 of Hispanic ancestry, and the black population grew to 348 in city households. Now, I know at least Ken and I grew up in Sheboygan. Cal, you did? You but Tom, you're in... Um, I came here in 69, so... Oh, oh. you're a newcomer. <laughs> a newcomer, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You don't qualify. I did not grow up here. Um, it was certainly uh, at least 98.3% white when I was growing up here. And uh, um, so it's a changing face, and I think that's one of the um, uh, points of the uh, fairly lengthy article that was in the press. What are your thoughts? Uh, are we grappling? Are we gracefully dealing with issues relating to different skin colors, different cultures? Well, I think it's, I'm glad the paper's doing that. There's going to be a series of articles that are going to look at different aspects of this. But uh, we see incidences that have occurred recently where people have called people of other colors or other uh, cultures certain derogatory names. And I think that's uh, an indication of a, of a populace that's uh, experiencing something new. Um, there are places in this country where people have grown up having almost a 50-50 split in uh, different cultures and races. And uh, what Sheboygan's going through here is something new. And I think it's going to take some adjustment. and. Uh, hopefully uh, some improvement on the part of some people and how they behave towards each other. One of the really dramatic places I think that the diversity uh, issues really have arisen is in the, in the Sheboygan Area School District, which at least when I was on the school board was nearing 30% minority kids um, with 29 different languages being spoken within the district. Um, and some stunning challenges I think for public education as they try to deal with kids who mm -hmm. come not only with different cultures but just no ability to communicate in the language. Is that my cue? <laughs> <laughs> well, it, really, it, it really has changed dramatically. I've been in the district for 22 years. Uh, and in those 22 years, the diversity of the student body, both at North and South High School and across the entire district, has changed dramatically. It's been a, 
a real, and of course, you know, we had uh, we have a department now called ELL, which is English Language Learners, which never did, didn't even exist when I started did this profession all well, these many years ago. Um, and it, it's been a challenge. It's particularly a challenge for us, of course, because the No Child Left Behind legislation requires that all those uh, racial groups, um, eventually the gap between them and Caucasian groups will have to be narrowed. Um, they have to be showing adequate yearly, yearly progress. Um, so far, we've been able to do that, but every year the bar gets higher and higher, and, and uh, eventually, uh, I'm not sure if we're gonna be able to do that. It's gonna be a real, mm -hmm. it's gonna be a real challenge for us. What's really, you know, on, on the positive side, you've got you know, an Hispanic mayor, obviously. The school board uh, uh, had, one, of course, one on the school board before that. We just recently added a, uh, a Hmong representative of the board. Uh, so there's some beginnings, and we have uh, an Hispanic uh, female on the board right now as well. So we have some representation. Um, the sense, at least in the high schools, is as I watch the students and as the faculty talks about this, is that the Hmong population, uh, as time has gone on, um, at least the, the wave that showed up, say, 5, 10 years ago or 15 years ago, have really pretty much assimilated you, you, when you start seeing the graduation rates and the, the number, we had Chris Yang over at South and we've had previous Hmong valedictorians and salutatorians, and so they're beginning to get in the mainstream. We haven't quite frankly, and in all candor, we've not cracked the Hispanic riddle yet, though, in, in the school district. That still remains a challenge. When you look at our test scores, Hmong performance is generally better than Hispanic performance. The gap between Hmong students and Asian students in general and white uh, Caucasian students is narrowed somewhat depending on which building you're looking at, well, but overall there's been progress there. Um, so we have a ways to go. We have well, a ways it isn't to go. just a school challenge. Uh, this week's Newsweek is an extensive article on, on that and the mobility that does occur because of education. And when you have first and second generations of certain yeah. cultures that are not moving ahead educationally as much as they ought to, uh, that has a ripple effect throughout the whole mm -hmm. assimilation game. Yeah. Uh, the Campus at Sheboygan uh, recently has, with our new dean, who's of Hispanic, uh, Ray Hernandez, he's made a concerted effort to uh, uh, expand the minority uh, student population. And over the last two or three years, I, I could, you know, it really is different. I mean, there's a lot more uh, Asian students uh, uh, represented than. I can recall in past years. But I may even go back to when I started here back in 69, since when did I come? Uh, the, the population was uh, 52 or 53 percent male. Now that's changed. We're probably 53 or 54 percent female at the university. So if you talk about diversity, there's a little bit of a switch to more females going to the uh, university as just opposed mm -hmm. to ethnic kinds of things, and adult students going back to school, uh, coming back to school, adult education. So in the educational area, there's a little more diversity than it was when I initially started uh, here. And then, of course, uh, let's go back to the ethnic. Uh, it's just fun watching the Hmong in the parade. They're so proud to be a United States of America citizens. Uh, they wave the flag, they dress appropriately in their attire, but they wave the flag, and uh, that's uh, kind of exciting. I remember when my kids um, were little and went to Grant School, and uh, that was a, a magnet school for, uh, for Hmong kids, and 35 to 40 percent of Grant School at that time uh, was Hmong children, and it was a neat thing for my kids to be able to go to school with children who certainly had a different culture and uh, looked different from them, and uh, it, it was a good thing. But I think, uh, um, you know, those, those kind of trends are going to continue. I remember my dad uh, was a pharmacist for Rainitz Drugs for years and years and years, and he was at Fessler's for a long time. And that was in the 50s, 60s, and even into the 70s when he, we, he spoke what we called pigeon German. <laughs> but there were a lot of particularly old, little old ladies who would come in and they would just speak German with him. And the dear man that he was, he didn't really quite understand German, but he could kind of understand what they were, what they were trying to get at and, and that meld of language. And I think that ethnicity of people speaking German in, in, in public of schools or, or institutions is pretty much gone, but not that long ago yeah. where you still had... It wasn't had long ago that WHBL had German church services still broadcast. 
So it it is amazing how, in terms of immigrant populations, we really do we really do absorb. And um, but it is it is the case. And I think Cal, you were mentioning in just an earlier discussion that Hispanic students or a lot of students coming from Mexico. And I know a lot of our Hispanic students are from Mexico coming up here during the the job boom in the in the late uh, uh, well in the late '90s, uh, more or less. Um, just not making that transition. Any, you three educators, any ideas? I, agree, on... I don't know. Uh, well, we, there was an input, simple solution. We'd have found it by now, even us, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, <laughs> but it, part of it, you know, part of it is cultural, and it's hard for me as being the you know white German Caucasian guy in the audience, you know, to figure out to figure out exactly um, how to decode Hispanic culture for for us. Um, and, and part of it has to do with the lack of male role models, I think, at the high school level. I think, it's, I think our, our Hispanic girls are more likely to be a little more successful in classrooms and move on and get their degrees and things than, say, our Hispanic male students do. Um, and, and that's part of it. And, and part of it is, is a culture that uh, perceives school learning perhaps a little bit different than, than Asian culture. Um, when I have parent-teacher conferences, I, I rarely see an Hispanic uh, a parent. Uh, I really do see lots of Hmong parents, and, and they're a little more, uh, the way they express their concern is a little more typical of what we'd expect from a majority culture, you know, mm -hmm. where we get telephone calls or we get, um, they show up at parent-teacher conferences and those kinds of things. I know that, it, and the public doesn't really much know this, but I, uh, in the next couple of years, south and north in different ways, are going to start exploring ways to build what we call in the profession small learning communities within the high schools, mm -hmm. breaking these large high schools down into schools within schools or in some way. We, we're just beginning to have that conversation and get parents involved and students involved. And one of the reasons we are doing that is because in a place where at South, North, so now South will have probably about 1,500 students next year, North about 1,750 uh, because of the boundaries and the way the cities are growing. Um, we just really feel we lose kids in the shuffle. Mm -hmm. You know, and you've got really what is a factory model. Every kid's rotating every 50 minutes. You, teachers change from semester to semester. You may never have, you never, you never see a kid again. Yeah. And that's, I think, going to be part of what we're going to try to do in, in establishing some more human contacts with kids and more continuous contacts and more mentoring. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned culture earlier in your yeah. comments. You didn't really say you didn't know how to, and you didn't quite understand the culture because yeah. of our background. Well, I, I belong to St. Clement's Church, and that's a Spanish. Uh, I mean, St. Clement's yes, Church is, is uh, really two, two churches. It's a Spanish church, and then it's the white uh, Anglo-Saxon church. And, I, they've tried to get together over the years, but they, they I mean, they do, but uh, they still keep their separate cultures. We have a Spanish mass and we have a, a regular mass. One of the analysis <laughs> about uh, the integration of cultures is the, the uniqueness of the Hispanic community that's coming to the United States. It's overwhelmingly Mexican, um, and it's a higher percentage of Mexican uh, than any other group we've had for many, many years. If you go back and say, well, in early immigration, how many, what percentage was Italian, what percentage was French or Hungarian or whatever, and the numbers were rather small, uh, but we have this large influx of Hispanics, the majority of which are, are Mexican. And so you do have a culture that becomes almost a, a very large subculture. And so their activities, their language, their whole um, community is one of a size that can almost be operable within another exactly, community. Exactly, exactly. And the assimilation challenges sure. are maybe not there. If you're the only, you know, one of 20 Russians in a community, you probably are forced to, to become maybe more assimilated than if you're one of, of, you know, several thousand of another culture. So that's one of the challenges that uh, they say Hispanics um, and particularly Mexicans are, are facing in becoming part of a new culture. And you know the the, the flip side of that, in, in some respect, is that it is an important part of life that we keep the ethnic cultures that are of that are our backgrounds, 
that, uh, you know, I grew up in a very Irish family. I mean, you talk about a minority in, in Sheboygan, being Irish was certainly that. Um, but people do want to, and rightfully so, hang on to their wonderful cultures and traditions. Mm -hmm. And one of the nice things you see in Milwaukee, which I just love, are all the fests. So you can get Polish fest and, and uh, Irish fest and an Italian fest and on and on. So people do celebrate their cultures. And I think, so we're always doing that balance between assimilation and celebrating what you know, is uniquely ours and, and, uh, and so forth. So it, it, it'll be interesting. Never has Sheboygan, though, been much of a magnet for African-American people. Um, the press article says that in 1980, we, there were 57 black residents. And in 2000, that had grown to 348. That's hardly a huge, a huge boom. Uh, and it's always been interesting to me because with Milwaukee not far from us, substantial African-American population in Milwaukee, why not the migration up to, to Sheboygan, which is certainly a, a wonderful and pleasant place to live. And uh, I, I don't know why. And I think of all the minorities that live within the area black, residents maybe feel the, mo the most isolated? I don't know, is that, a, is that a fair statement? I think there was a lot of homogeneity in Sheboygan as far as white culture. I mean, German, Dutch, and you had pretty well new, uh, you know, that was established. I think Milwaukee, for example, had the same situation. Look at the tensions they had with the Polish South Side and Father Grappi in his uh, mm -hmm. desegregation efforts. He was going to march across what was a Sixth Street viaduct into the Polish area. So I think some of that probably is just the solidity of the, and the uniformity of the, of the white culture that was in Sheboygan for many years. Yeah. But yeah. wasn't there, I may be overstating it, if you were from Sheboygan, uh, you were in. If you were an outsider, you were out, so to speak, on the uh, social networks. Was that, a, was that something 15, 20 years ago, new people coming to Sheboygan? Well, at St. Clement's, uh, one of the, the priests at St. Clement's when I was there growing up, Father Ken Fieber, was very involved in uh, something called Youth for Integration, Y for I. And I was involved in that just even in grade school and then as well uh, into high school of trying to figure out why, why whites were not comfortable going into the inner core of Milwaukee and why blacks were not comfortable coming up to, uh, to Sheboygan. But I, whatever issues were there certainly seemed to remain. Um, I, th I just find the complaint of Isaac Thomas, the, uh, the African-American fellow who indicated that he had been beat up by the police, just, it's a fascinating thing. And I, I saw in the paper that he's filed a notice of claim with the city. Uh, which he needs to do within 120 days to, to um, preserve any right that he might have to sue for damages. But as far as I understand, he has yet to file any charges with the Police and Fire Commission about the way he believes he was treated that night. So the Police and Fire Commission, which would be a place for this fellow to get a hearing at least about the facts of what happened, he's just simply not, not uh, taken advantage of. And according to the newspaper picture, has his house up for That's sale. For sale he's going to leave, yeah. So it, it hardly seems to be a, a welcome sign, at least. Get back to Tom's question. I think there was a time where, uh, you know, like all small towns, you know, it's very difficult for me because I didn't live any other place than this place for any long period of time to know how typical we are. Mm -hmm. but, but Sheboygan certainly was insular, and there was a certain set of, I mean, I, I mean, the families know one another, there's names and there's intermarriages and, and I, I don't talk about three degrees of separation, you know, from anybody for quite some time. And I think, I think as a person who comes into the community, you have to spend some time now trying to figure, you know, again, decode all that, try to figure that all out and navigate that, negotiate that and understand how families fit and, and, and uh, how, how there's yeah. the meeting after the meetings and, and the meetings yeah. that take place, whether they be at Pine Hills or wherever they might be. Um, but that being said, you know, you got Mark Hanna, who just is the school board president. He's a relative newcomer to the community. Juan Perez is a relative newcomer to the community. I think when you look at the, say, our school board, uh, Ron is, uh, Ron Rinfleisch is probably a lifetime resident, but I think the vast, large majority of those mm -hmm. members are no longer, no longer uh, the locals. And you look back at the board, say, in 1978, 79, and there's, you know, Garten and Rischel, and I mean, these are people, you know, names have been around for quite some time. Mm -hmm. So I think the place is opening up. I think for African Americans, not that I can speak for them, 
but I, I think there's sort of a critical mass that needs to, before mm -hmm. people become yeah. comfort, it gets to what yeah. Cal was talking about earlier. And I still think there's a, this sort of notion that if you're an African-American walking down the streets of Sheboygan, everybody's pretty much still looking at you. Yeah. It's not that there's any necessarily animosity or unwelcoming, it's just, it's, but it's just unusual. It's color. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's yeah. unusual. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. I mean, I remember a time in a kid where, you know, the only African-American I knew in Sheboygan was a postal employee. I mean, everybody knew, I don't know what the gentleman's name was, but that was it. Yeah. Um, you're starting to see that now. What's interesting, at, or at least at South, where we have a good, well, probably about three dozen African American students, um, do they tend to keep to themselves? Not, not really. And there's interracial dating that's going on, and that doesn't seem to be a, ter a terribly, mm -hmm. terribly big issue. So, to that degree, that the, the city is welcoming. Uh, you know, we've been talking about race, but one of the things that nobody really much is talking about, it's kind of under the radar screen, is. When you looked at when the state testing began and we started gathering all these demographics over at South and North, mm -hmm. it's like to say South, for example, because I'm more familiar with those numbers. We had the same percentage of, of um, minority students as we do today, some seven, eight years later. <laughs> but what has really changed is the number of students who are coming from what the government would define as poverty uh, families you know, that qualify for hot lunch. That used to be about 10% of our student body. It is now about one third of our student mm. body. And so you really have a, an undercurrent of some fairly poor white uh, students that are be really coming into, into our system and part of our reality that's really not being discussed in the community whatsoever. And I don't know if that's because of the deindustrialization that's going on and, mm. and all that, that, that that's happening in the community. But uh, we start looking at our test scores and trying to figure out who's the populations of kids we really gotta work with. And we start looking at it's it's things have really have changed in the sense that we have we're becoming more of a, a poverty school um, than and that's true for the entire district by the way, yeah. Um, yeah. and probably somewhat reflective of other communities, but we don't have you know have that data readily available. I think yeah. the uh, the Badger yeah. Care statistics are a good example of that. Uh, right. Places like um, Walmart, in other words, where they have a high percentage of employees on Badger mm -hmm. Care because they don't provide benefits and their workers are rather low, low pay. So as we move to a service sector, and we know a uh, number of those industries uh, in, in Wisconsin or in Sheboygan uh, just don't pro provide benefits as they did 20 years ago. Yeah, yep. Is the income level of the city of Sheboygan or the county of Sheboygan, uh, median income level of families gone down from census? I'd have to look at that. Uh, I think they've been pretty stagnant once you adjust yeah, for inflation. But, there's, there's, but you, it's, that's happened at the national level too. But mm -hmm. if you look at the gap, it's different. You've got the wealthy are more wealthy, and the poor are having they're becoming greater numbers. But you average it all together, and it, it looks very well, similar not, to what it looks pretty pretty median, decent. But yeah. uh, the numbers do rely on don't rely or don't tell a story of what has happened to the, the, the discrepancy between the rich and the poor. That is that's really developing in this country. Mm -hmm. And I, th I think just as, as we kind of segue into another topic, um, it is my understanding, I, c I could be wrong, that, that Mayor Perez is actually looking to constitute um, a citizens group to talk about diversity in the community and the challenges and the richness that it provides. And uh, so that'll be, a, that'll be interesting to see how that develops. Speaking of the city, there have been some victories and some losses. Um, the um, um, uh, Park and Forestry Commission is back by a 14 to 2 vote. I believe that was at last week's uh, city council meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and uh, Alderman Danberg apparently thinks it's just one too many committees. As I read the, the newspaper article, I, I did not see the meeting. Um, it's a campaign promise that has been um, uh, enacted pretty quickly. Uh, we're looking at police sites. Uh, do we have any bets <coughs> as to where, where the police station might end up? Sure is quiet. It, I, it is, isn't it? There's sure. a front runner. I haven't seen it. it. I, know. And, and, I haven't either. And you know, the, the sleeping giant here is, where's the money going to come from to build this? Uh, it's. Uh, well, we, Little by little, there's starting to be a community discussion. Instead of emanating from City Hall, people are now starting to throw ideas out. Somebody said, maybe we should decide what shared services we want to uh, work to provide before we decide where we place this uh, new uh, police station. Uh, and I thought, okay, that's a decent idea to think about. In other words, <laughs> 
put think where, about the goal put, before you start building. <laughs> put where the money's <laughs> going to come from to build this thing, because you mentioned the money. <laughs> and if it comes from savings and shared services, then we want it to be close to the uh, uh, county uh, facility so we could more adequately save them. But it seems like there's been a lot more input, uh, community kinds of talk on how best to serve. Uh, I, everybody says what the center of the city is, and my own opinion is that the city's too small to have a center. I mean, we, our police station could be located on the other side of I-43 and it'd still be close to everything. Well, it's, it's, <laughs> it's funny. We, so it's where do you, you know, where best to locate it to for we all have services. Yeah, we all have <laughs> relatives who live in big cities who are <laughs> astonished by our thought we have to drive all the way out to Menards or all the way out to Home Depot. It's going to take, yeah. I had to come all the way out to the University of Wisconsin, yeah. Sheboygan. <laughs> you know, it took me, my God, it must have been almost 10 minutes to get out here. And so I think there is that. Uh, it's an entire 15 minutes to get across town. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, and I understand that the line, the actual, the geographic line uh, as to the center of the city is a little bit to the south of where the station is now. So the North 23rd site, at least now, is not, is not the center of the city, uh, but that with building trends and so forth, at a certain point, it may be much closer to the center of the city than, say, a downtown site. So, so those, are, those are interesting pieces. If it goes to a referendum, if that's one of the funding mechanisms that uh, we're looking at, do you think that the citizens of Sheboygan will vote in favor uh, of a uh, police station? Of a police station. I, I, th I think they would. Um, I think, I they think would even too. The, some of the uh, fiscally conservative letters that the editor recently have said, "Well, just kick out everybody else in City Hall and give the City Hall to the police department." So I think they appreciate the police are rather cramped in that rather old building, and they yeah. need something. They need more room. Yeah. I, I, and it is a relatively rare thing to hear. And there have been one or two letters saying, ah, we don't need this new police station. But by and large, I think that the, the, the recognition of the need is pretty universal. So I think even at a referendum, um, but the, 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 the borrowing for it is, is going to be tricky. Sure. Uh, because it, it really is, uh, it's just that expensive. And, and we still have resolved the Tabor issue that's going on on the state level. I mean, it's kind of quiet now, but you don't know what's going to be wrought in the state budget and other documents to control municipal spending, which further exacerbates the financing picture. Yeah, and I'm sure we'll hit on that at some, some point in the future, but just as we begin, just begin the city budget process, I think, I think it's very tough. Hmm. You know, we talk about actually who really would want to be a mayor or a city <laughs> council person or a governor or a senator in, in just these uh, these very very difficult times. I, yeah. I think it's uh, I think it's kind of tough. So, well, as always, the time seems to have gone just uh, very quickly, and uh, we've solved as usual the problems. I think if the <laughs> four of us were just in charge of everything, would it would be very smooth? You know, just as. <laughs> <laughs> We'd have all sides represented in Fastest that. Fastest recall election <laughs> ever, ever, ever summoned. This diversity yes. group here, diverse Ex group here. Exactly. So, well, thanks again, and um, we'll be getting together again, and thanks for joining us.